uh, Texas, the, the state with the longest border with Mexico. Is this a viable option, what we just heard? Well, I, to talk about it, but I, I don't see it as being very practical. I think it's a much bigger problem. I, you can't deal with immigration without dealing with the economy. The weaker the economy, the more resentment that there is when illegals come in. If you have a healthy, vibrant economy, it's not a problem. We're usually looking for workers. Even under today's circumstances, a lot of businesses are looking for workers and they don't have them. They don't, they're not as well trained here. But also, the way we're handling our borders is actually hurting our economy because uh, the, the business people, uh, you know, uh, visitors have a hard time of coming in. I mean, we we don't have a well-managed border, so I think we need more resources, and I think most of the other candidates would agree we need more resources, but where are the resources going to come from? I have a suggestion. I think we spend way too much time worrying about the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Use some of those resources on our own border. Uh, Speaker, Speaker Gingrich, uh, you had an ad, but you pulled it this week, in which you described Governor Romney as the most anti-immigrant candidate. Why did you do that? Why do, we, why do we describe them that way? Because I th in the original conversations about deportation, the position I took, which he attacked pretty ferociously, was that grandmothers and grandfathers aren't going to be successfully deported. We're not, we're, we as a nation are not going to walk into some family, and by the way, they're going to end up in a church, which will declare them a sanctuary. We're not going to walk in there and grab a grandmother out and then kick them out. We're not gonna, and I, I think you have to be realistic in your indignation. I want to control the border. I want English to be the official language of government. I want us to have a, a lot of changes. I am prepared to be very tough and very bold, but I'm also prepared to be realistic because I've actually had to pass legislation in Washington, and I don't believe an unrealistic promise is going to get through, but I do believe if there's some level of humanity for people who have been here a long time, we can pass legislation that will decisively reduce illegality, decisively control the border, and will once again mean the people who are in America are here legally. I, I just want to make sure I understand. Is he still the most anti-immigrant candidate? I think of the four of us, yes. Go ahead, Governor. That, that's simply inexcusable. That's inexcusable. And actually, Senator Marco Rubio came to my defense and said that ad was inexcusable and inflammatory and inappropriate. Mr. Speaker, I'm not anti-immigrant. My father was born in Mexico. My wife's father was born in Wales. They came to this country. The idea that I'm anti-immigrant is repulsive. Don't use a term like that. You can say we disagree on certain policies, but to say that enforcing the U.S. law to protect our borders to welcome people here legally, to expand legal immigration, as I approve, that that's somehow anti-immigrant, is simply the, the kind of over-the-top rhetoric that has characterized American politics too long. And I'm glad that Marco Rubio called you out on it. I'm glad you withdrew it. I think you should apologize for it. And I think okay. you should recognize that having differences of opinions on issues does not justify labeling people with highly charged epithets. I'll tell you what. I'll give you an opportunity to self-describe. You tell me what language you would use to describe somebody who thinks that deporting a grandmother or a grandfather from their family, you know, just tell me the language. I'm perfectly happy for you to explain what language you would use. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think I described following the law as it exists in this country, which is to say, I'm not going around and rounding people up and deporting them. What I said was people who come here legally get a work permit. People who do not come here legally do not get a work permit. Those who don't get work will tend over time to self-deport. I'm not going to go find grandmothers and take them out of their homes and deport them. Those are your words, not my words. And to use that, that rhetoric suggests to people that somehow, if you're not willing to keep people here who violated the law, that you're anti-immigrant. Nothing could be further from the truth. I am pro-immigrant. I want people to come to America with skill and vitality and vibrance. I want them to come legally. There are grandmothers that live on the other side of the border that are waiting to come here legally. I want them to come here too, not just those that are already here. Uh, okay. So we have gone, we've gone from your Washington attack when I first proposed this. And you said it was outrageous, it would be a magnet, to you're accepting the fact that, you know, a family's going to take care of their grandmother or their grandfather. The, the, the idea that you're going to push them out in some form by simply saying they can't go get a job, 
I think the grandmother is still going to be here. All I want to do is allow the grandmother to be here legally with some rights to have residency but not citizenship so that he or she can finish their life with dignity within the law. You know, they're not, they're not 11 million. They're not 11. Our, our problem is not 11 million grandmothers. Our, our problem is, all right. Our, our problem is 11 million people getting jobs that many Americans, legal immigrants, would like to have. It's school kids in, in schools that districts are having a hard time paying for. It's people getting free health care because we're required under the law to provide that health care. And the real concern is with people who want to come here illegally. Let's let legal immigrants come here. Let's stop illegal immigration. The rhetoric, the rhetoric on immigration, <laughs> Governor, has been intense, as you well know, as all four of you know, and anyone who watches television knows. You've had an ad running saying that uh, Speaker Gingrich called Spanish, quote, the language of the ghetto. What do you mean by that? Uh, I haven't seen the ad, so I'm sorry I don't get to see all the, uh, the TV ads. Uh, I don't know, what he, did, he, did he say that? Did you no, say what that? I said was we want everybody to learn English because we don't want, and I didn't use the word Spanish. We do not want anyone trapped in a situation where they cannot get a commercial job, they cannot rise, and virtually every parent of every ethnic group, and by the way, there are 94 languages spoken at, in the Miami-Dade College, 94 languages. And that's why I think English should be the official language of government, and that's why I think every young American should learn English. And my point was, no one should be trapped in a linguistic situation where they can't go out and get a job, and they can't go out and work. So I would say as much as Governor Romney doesn't particularly like my use of language. I found his use of language and his deliberate distortion equally offensive. I'd like... I, I doubt that's my ad, but we'll take a look and find out. There are a bunch of ads out there that are being organized by other people, but I think our position on English in our schools and in our nation is the same which I believe English should be the official language of the United States, as it is. I also believe that in our schools, we should teach kids in English. So when I was governor, I fought for, actually before I was governor, I fought for during my election and thereafter a program to have English immersion in our schools so our kids could learn in English. I think we agree on this, which is, you know what? Kids in this country should learn English so they can have all the jobs and all the opportunity I, I want to bring here. Congressman Paul, Senator Santorum, into this. But let's take this question uh, from Miami. Uh, CNN uh, and Espanol's Juan Carlos Lopez uh, has a guest there. Hola Wolf, Estamos. we're at the viewing party for the Hispanic Leadership Network and it really is a party. They're holding their yearly conference, a meeting of Hispanic Republican leaders. And I'm joined by Raquel Rodriguez, she's an attorney in Miami, she practices business and international law, and she has a question for, our, uh, for the candidates. Yes, good evening. The U.S. has been largely away in its uh, foreign and trade policy with Latin America. In the meantime, Iran and China have been increasing their influence over and involvement in uh, Latin America through the leftist and left-leaning governments. What would each of you do as president to more deeply engage in Latin America and, importantly, to support the uh, governments and the political parties that support democracy and free markets? Congressman Paul. Well, I think free trade is the answer. Uh, free trade is an answer to a lot of conflicts around the world, so I'm always promoting free trade. And you might add Cuba, too. I think we'd be a lot better off with Cuba, trading with Cuba. So, so I, I think the more you can do to promote this free trade, the better off we'll, we'll be. But uh, as far as us having an obligation, a military or a financial obligation to go down and dictate to them what government they should have, uh, I, don't, I don't like that idea. I would work with the people, encourage and encourage free trade, and try to set a standard here where countries in Central America or South America or any place in the world would want to emulate us and set the standards that we have. Unfortunately, sometimes we slip up on our standards and uh, we go around the world and we try to force ourselves on others. I don't think the nations in South America and Central America necessarily want us to come down there and dictate which government they should have. And uh, yet, I believe with friendship and trade, uh, you can have a lot of influence. And I strongly believe that it's time we have friendship and trade with Cuba. Yeah. Senator Santorum, are, are you with Congressman Paul? Uh, no, I'm not with Congressman Paul, and I'm not with Barack Obama on this issue. Our policy in Central and South America under this administration has been abysmal. 
the way we have treated, in particular, countries like Honduras. Honduras was stood up for the rule of law, which threw out a, dic a, a would-be dictator who was using the Chavez playbook from Venezuela in order to, to try to run for re-election in Honduras. And the United States government, instead of standing behind the pro-democracy, the people in the parliament, the people in the Supreme Court, who tried to enforce the Constitution of Honduras, instead of siding with them, the Democrats, President Obama sided with two other people in South America, excuse me, Central America and South America, Chavez and Castro and Obama, sided against the people of Honduras. This is a consistent policy of siding with the leftists, siding with the Marxists, siding with those who don't support democracy, not standing up for our friends in Colombia, not standing up for our friends who want to engage and support America, who want to be tra great trading partners and great allies for our country, to, to be able to form that kind of bond that is so essential in our own hemisphere. The European Union understood how important it was for diverse people to be able to come together in an economic unit. We only, not only have to come together as an economic unit, but the threat of terrorism, the threat of Iran now in Venezuela and in other places and in, in, in Cuba and in Nicaragua, the threat of radical Islam growing in that region, is it important for, it's absolutely important for us to have a president who understands that threat and understands the solution is closer ties. I will visit that area of the world repeatedly to solidify those ties when I become president. Let me let uh, Congressman Paul quickly respond. He, the senator mentioned standing up for some of these nations, but he doesn't define it. But standing up for nations like this usually means that we impose ourselves, go and pick the dictators, undermine certain governments, also sending them a lot of money. It doesn't work. Most of the time, this backfires. They resent us. We can achieve what he wants in a much different way than us using the bully uh, attitude that you will do it our way. Uh, this, this, is the, this is not a benefit to us. And besides, where are you going to get the troops and where are you going to get the money? Because you're talking about force. And I, I know of a much better way than using force to get along with people. I don't know where... I don't know what, co what answer Congressman Paul was listening to. He obviously wasn't listening to my answer. Um, <laughs> what I talked about is building strong economic relationships, strong national security relationships. No one's talking about force. No one's <laughs> talking about going into Cuba or going into Venezuela. It's talking about the other countries in the region, which are being influenced greatly by those countries that are tending and, and moving toward those militant socialists instead of the United States. Why? Because we've ignored them. We, you had a president of the United States that held a Colombian free trade agreement. Colombia, who's out there on the front lines working with us against the narco-terrorists, standing up to Chavez in South America. And what did we do? For political, domestic political purposes, the president of the United States sided with organized labor and the environmental groups and held Colombia hanging out to dry for three years. We cannot do that to our friends right. in South America. We're going we're gonna to come back to this. We're going to come back to Cuba as well. Uh, 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 but stand by for that. We did double check just now, Governor, that ad that we talked about uh, where I quoted you as saying that Speaker Gingrich called Spanish the language of the ghetto. We just double checked. It was one of your ads. It's running here in Florida in, 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 on, on the radio. And at the end, you say, I'm Mitt Romney and I approved this ad. So it, it, is, let me, it let me is here. Let me ask you a question. Let me, let me ask the speaker a question. Did, did you say what the ad says or not? I don't know. It's taken totally out of context. Oh, okay. I did, not, and I did not know. Yeah. I did not say it about Spanish. I said in general about all languages. We are better for children to learn English in general, period. Let, let's take a look at what he said. All right. Uh, we have a, a very important subject, housing, not only here in Florida, foreclosures, uh, really, really bad, but all over the country. Uh, and uh, a lot of people are wondering if the federal government contributed to the housing collapse in recent years. And so we got a question that came in to us. Uh, and uh, uh, let, me, let me put it up there and I'll read it to you. How would you phase out Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac? Does the private mortgage industry need additional regulation? That from William Schmidt. Uh, let me start with Governor Romney. Well, I, I think you know that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were a big part of why we have the housing crisis in the nation that we have. And, and we've had this discussion before. Uh, Speaker Gingrich was hired by Freddie Mac to promote them 
to, uh, uh, to uh, influence other people throughout Washington, encouraging them to uh, not to dismantle these two entities. I think that was an enormous mistake. Uh, I think instead we, we should have had a whistleblower and not a, a horn tutor.